Hello, it's Roger Bisbee here, back with another episode of Ask Skill Builder. We've got lots of questions coming in, so thank you very much for sending those in. Keep sending them in and keep those comments coming in because the comments are not only entertaining, but they help. They give another opinion, and it's not just about what I say. Obviously, there's trades people out there, people who've got experience of something. It's really good to get your input, so keep those coming. Now we've got a question from Matt Sidebottom, and he's having an extension built doing an extension and he wants to put in an extractor fan and he says he doesn't want to use one of those ones that goes through the wall because they're not powerful enough and he's dead right they're not i was doing some calculations actually only recently we worked out that with one of those little four inch extractors going through the wall they would and she's not got a large shower room it's only a little ensuite shower room but we reckoned that it would it would change the air in that shower room once every hour now the problem with that is that if you've just had a shower and you've had a 10 minute shower and it's going to take an hour before it takes all the steam out of that room, it's not going to do it because that steam is going to find somewhere to condense on before it even gets the chance to take it out through the room. So what she needed was something that would do four or five air changes an hour. So if you've got a 10 minute shower, if you think about it, that's you know you need six changes an hour if you were trying to get rid of all that steam while you were having a shower so on that kind of basis we looked at the inline fans that you can get from places like tool station screw fix and they're a bigger bulkier unit and they're really quite powerful and you put a duct on both ends so those fans increase the extraction rate enormously and that's what we decided to go for now the next problem is where do you put it and this is what matt's worried about he wants one of his fans but he's saying it's a big bulky unit and he's got a stud wall there he said he can't put it up in the ceiling because he's got a vaulted ceiling he needs to get access to it in the future so he can't just bury the thing up there if you don't want to put an access panel in the ceiling and i can understand why you might not want to you're a bit stuck so he's saying that he's having a stud wall built there should he increase the thickness of the stud wall and make a little place to put the fan in there well either that or stick it in the top of a wardrobe or somewhere like that if you mount the thing on rubber it won't be too noisy because the, uh, very often when you put the screws in and you mount the brackets onto the wall, you get that noise transmission. Don't forget, all fans get noisier as they carry on. And a lot of that is to do with dirt. It's to do with the debris building up. In fact, I just did one last week where it was very noisy. I took it apart, cleaned it out, put it back in. It's as silent as anything. So it's one of those things where they do need a bit of maintenance. You, they do need a bit of cleaning so you can't lock it away forever. And the other thing he said is he needs to run that duct down and where he's thinking of putting it is down through the soffit and he's saying is it acceptable to run it down through the soffit not only is it acceptable it's an ideal place to put it it's really good because it drains any moisture out of it as well that's the other thing you get condensation sometimes but you could even possibly mount the fan in the soffit but it would mean that you if you wanted to get hold of the fan you'd have to go up there and remove a little bit like an access panel or something you'd have to do it off a ladder which wouldn't be ideal yeah that's what i do i run that bit of ducting down through the skeeling as he's got because he's got a vaulted ceiling he's got a bit of skeeling running down there i've done it in my shower room here fun enough same thing just run it down through the skeeling and uh, out of the soffit so yeah good idea and um i fully agree that those little fans the little four inch fans that you get they're good enough for a loo. That's all they're for WCs. They're not really good enough for showers. Now we've got a question from Wayne and he sent us in loads of pictures here, which is really good. I really love to see the more pictures, the better. And he's insulating an attic here and he's been doing it with some Celotex uh, and he's got quite a way with it. And now he's asking whether he's doing the right thing. So maybe he's just discovered us and this is an ongoing job that he's doing. You've got to think about the dew point. You've got to think about the cold side of that insulation and about the fact that the, the warm air that you've got inside the building is going through. And when it gets to the other side of that insulation, at that point, it condenses into droplets of water. You really need a breathable 
felt on the outside of the insulation or no membrane at all in other words if it's an old-fashioned roof with open tiles or open slates that's fine because you'll get that draft going up and down there the worst thing is that you have a little air gap in the back there and then you have that old-fashioned roofing felt the bitumen stuff that doesn't allow the moisture to escape and then you've got this situation where you're getting moisture going through the house and it's just condensing on that point so that's why we have now breathable roofing felts to stop that happening if you haven't got that you can have some vents at the bottom and some vents at the top and you can get a flow of air going up the outside of that insulation board which will clear the moisture off it and that will help enormously so you've either got a breathable felt or you you need to put some ventilation in there in that air gap the other thing that you need to do is you need to put in a vapour barrier. Now the vapour barrier is to stop the moist air from the house going through, it will go through the plasterboard, believe it or not, as vapour, and it will find its way through that insulation one way or another, around the side, around the gaps, and it will condense. So what we do is we put a vapour barrier up, which either has to be something like a, a polythene membrane, which you can get from people like Visqueen and have a look because actually I've put vapor barriers up in the past which have just been thin polythene sheet and now I've been told that even some of those thin polythene sheets that the airborne moisture the vapor can actually get through it you wouldn't believe it but it it can happen so you need to stop that the other way that you can do it is you can get what they call vapor check plasterboard which is the plasterboard with the foil back which i would always recommend using in a loft we always used to use it in the loft conversions when i did those because it's a better product it gives you extra insulation cuts down on the radiated heat so it keeps the loft cooler in the summer which is quite nice and it also stops that vapor coming through the building and escaping into the loft Having said that, the other thing that you must do is if that loft is going to be used as a room, that's fine. But if it's just being used as a loft and you've got a loft hatch, make sure you've got a good seal around the loft hatch. And also any holes where you might have light fittings with cables coming through, they should have a bit of mastic seal around those to stop any moisture coming up. It is that critical that you just try to stop moisture coming up from below the house as much as you can and that includes putting extractor fans in the kitchen and the bathroom to take moisture away before it starts drifting up and getting into the loft because once it gets up into the loft you ain't never going to suck it back down again so once it's up in the loft it's going to be finding its way through that structure and condensing on the outside of the insulation so i hope that helps it's a bit of a science what i would suggest you do is you have a look at the literature from kingspan from Celatex, from visqueen who talk about vapor barriers because there's loads and loads on the internet to help you in terms of getting that job right in terms of diagrams showing you exactly what happens but it's one of those things that a lot of people misunderstand and roofers a lot of the time when they're putting a new roof on they just rely on what they call a breathable membrane and sometimes they come badly unstuck with it so here we are here's a question from chris peacock and he's got a fence he says it's just about to blow its load all over the public footpath you can see what's happening there the earth is pushing through the timbers have got a bit rotten and he's wondering what to do about it well chris funnily enough i'm engaged on a job at the moment doing this and it's exactly the same it's got a public footpath going along it and what i've done is put in concrete slotted posts all the way along and i've used concrete gravel boards to kind of contain the earth behind it and they just slot in to the post so you can build those up two or three high if you like now I don't think that the concrete gravel boards and the post is quite enough as a retaining wall so what I've done is I've dug the earth away from behind where those posts and those panels are going to be and I've put in a bit of rubble along there just ordinary old concrete and brick rubble and so on and that's kind of just stabilized the ground and given it a little bit of something to drain away and hopefully not push but what you could do is just pour a little bit of rubble in there and put a bit of loose fill concrete in there sort of lean mix nine to one and just make a sort of pre fence fence if you like just a buffer so quite easy to do uh, if you like digging so the next one we've got is just uh 
really a, just an email there's no picture with this but it's from dave madden now dave has only recently discovered that if you're carrying waste materials then you need a waste carrier's license so in other words if you're a tradesperson and you're doing a job at someone's house and you say to them oh i'll take that bit of rubbish away maybe it's an old sink or something like that then you get stopped by the police and they say to you, what have you got in the back? They have a look and they say, where's your waste carrier's license? And if you haven't got one, you can be fine. Now, Dave cites a, a case down south, he says, where a roofer was fined for having a bag which contained a load of old crisp packets and things like that. And he said, you know, this is outrageous really. And, and he's wondering what the logic is in it and whether he actually needs one of his licenses. Well, even if you are disposing of of rubbish you're getting somebody else to take the rubbish away so, so you know one of these very helpful guys pitches up with one of those transits you know with a higher sides and he says i'll take your rubbish away mate for a hundred quid now if you let him do that you need a waste carrier's license he needs one but you also need one and the idea of this is that if the guy then subsequently goes and tips it in some country lane or on somebody else's drive as very often happens i mean it's a real epidemic where i live and i hate it i really really nothing makes me more angry well a few things but anyway does get me very hot under the collar i never ever entertain those guys if they come around and say clear your rubbish mate i say no having said that the whole thing is a mess the idea of these waste carriers licenses is that they're trying to regulate and stop this fly tipping but i don't think it's doing anything because i think the police are actually afraid of those guys a lot of them we've had tools stolen by people we know exactly where they are but they say oh no we can't go down there we need to take a liaison officer with us and all this and then and, and they're just running a mile from this they know it's happening they could do more to stop it they could confiscate the vehicles that would be the best thing if they just impounded the vehicles you know and these guys started losing their vehicles every time they were caught that would stop it but it is a nightmare but i don't think this legislation having these waste carrier license has done anything to stop it and in some ways all it's doing is penalizing the legitimate people like us are just taking a little bit of waste away for the customer and the other thing is of course that You've got this problem when you go down to your local tip a lot of the time is that they want to charge you for putting one piece of plasterboard in there. They want to charge you five quid or something. And, you know, I get such intimidation when I go down there. Even if I'm taking my own stuff down from my own house, I have to register the van and I have to show them what I've got, explain to them where it's coming from. And sometimes it can be quite intimidating, those people. So it all needs sorting out because it's definitely not getting any better. Fly tipping is an epidemic and we need to sort it out. Oh, actually, there is something here from Dave and it's a picture of his fishing. You must be a fisherman, Dave. Nice little picture anyway. The next question is from Kate. Now, Kate sent us loads of pictures. So thanks for that, Kate. It's always helpful to see a lot. And she's saying she's got this build, the builder, the original builder, he was going to do the drain work, the drainage later on. He's got a cut into the existing drain and he has gone. The job he was going to do, he's probably taken his money, gone down the road and he doesn't fancy doing this drain. I love doing drains. It, you know, if I could if I could get around there, I'd love to do this, but it's, it's, it's quite simple really. All you've got to do is dig around the drain, dig underneath that drain, you know, for about three foot, you know either side of where you want to join the connection to float some concrete underneath it you know six inch thick pad stone or concrete all the way under the drain both sides so that you've got something to build the manhole off and then you just get an angle grinder with a diamond blade in it and you cut the drain halfway through so that instead of it being a round pipe it becomes just a channel and then you can build the the manhole off that now a lot of other people the way they would do it is they would cut the drain in two places and they would get a couple of slip couplings and they would put one of these plastic manholes in there which is a very quick and easy way of doing it but I like the old-fashioned manhole with the benching and everything else and I don't think it takes that much longer to do it really so it's not a huge job if you find a ground worker to do it and um, there's plenty of those guys around you know they don't have to find anybody too expensive somebody's going to come out and do it I reckon it's probably with the brickwork as well. There's probably two days work in that. So let's assume that the guy's gonna charge you 200 pounds a day, 400, say 500 quid bit of materials. You know, it's gonna be 500, 600 quid to get that manhole connected up. 
and give you a pipe out of it that you can connect all the others. She said she's got all the drains are still inside the building, so they can't put the floor down until they've moved all those out and reconnected them. Now, if you want all that work done as well, then obviously that's gonna be a bit more expensive and it could start racking up, but that's a job that you may want to look at doing yourself with a plastic connections. It makes it very easy these days, but um, yeah, it's unfortunate when you, you fall out with builders and they, or not fall out, but when they lose interest sometimes in the job and just, just drift off. A lure unto themselves sometimes, builders, and I should know because I'm one of them. <laughs>